I want to be respectful of everybody's time. So I'm going to pass it over to our chief. So that way we can begin our Coffee with a Cop. Welcome, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us for coffee this morning from uh, Virtual World. Uh, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And for that, we uh, invited Angela Rose from the New Life Center, uh, which is a domestic violence uh, shelter program, and to talk about uh, sex trafficking and uh, victims of sex trafficking. Uh, New Life Center recently received a grant from the Department of Justice uh, for, to uh, assist with uh, sex trafficking victims. I just want to shout out to Mayor B.N. Wilner and Council Members Thomason and Andy. And I, um, thanks for joining us this morning. And I'll give you a moment if you want to say a few words. This is Council Member Thomason. I didn't want to jump in in front of either of my two esteemed colleagues except to say good morning and thank you all for joining us and especially to our team in blue for hosting this and once again bringing us very useful resources. It's interesting how every day you find a new way to keep us safe and protect us and most importantly help us feel safe. So thanks very much to all of you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Mayor Bian Wilner here. Can you hear me? Yep, we can okay, hear you. Thank you. I'm sorry for the delay there, and thanks to Council Member Thomason and, and also Council Member Andine for joining. I just wanted to echo those sentiments and thanks our, thank our police department for continuing these uh, programs. We welcome our, our special guest. Uh, Ms. Rose to speak with us about an important topic, which we will be recognizing as well at town hall, but um, appreciate the, the efforts to raise awareness and also really appreciate um, all the citizens who continue to participate and uh, stay involved, even though we're doing it virtually now in the safest way we can. We all look forward to getting back together in person. I do have my mug of coffee. It's actually a pint glass. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those mornings, so hopefully everyone can enjoy some coffee, and uh, I'm looking forward to the presentation. Thank you, Chief and, and uh, Commander Cole and Officer McGee. Uh, thank You're you, Mayor. Welcome. This is Council Member Ann Dean. Just wanted to welcome everyone to the Coffee with a Cop, and thank you for your continued um, participation um, in this series. Uh, domestic violence is an important issue, and um, uh, I look forward to the content. and. Um, Again, thank you to the chief and the police department for keeping our uh, city or our town safe and um, uh, bringing this content to us. And I will yield to the chief. I see uh, the vice mayor has joined us as well. If she wanted to just say uh, open and then we'll uh, get on with the program. Welcome. Thank you. thank you chief. And thanks for all you guys do. You're just awesome. And it's great. You're keeping these going and such an important topic again. So thank you again. And, and thanks to you and your team. And please always tell them how much our town supports them. We value the officers and their approach and their concierge style and their outreach to the schools and the people. So you guys are just awesome. So thank you. Thank you. And without further ado, uh, Miss Rose, if the stage is yours. Great. Thank you, Chief. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. Thank you for having me. Um, as she stated, my name is Angela Rose, and I work with New Life Center. New Life Center is a domestic and sexual violence agency. We are actually based in the West Valley. Um, so I'm going to talk about just what we do real quickly and about the grant that Chief mentioned um, that we received, and then we're going to just cover kind of sex trafficking 101. So a light topic for us to start our morning off and then there'll be time for questions after. So let me make sure that my PowerPoint is working. Here we go. Okay, so New Life Center, we are, we started out as a residential program. So we operate an emergency shelter. We're a 104 bed shelter out in Goodyear and we provide services to men, women and children. We also provide outreach services, which is basically mobile advocates out in the community who provide advocacy services and resources and support like participants would receive, but out in the community. So you don't have to be in shelter to receive those services. 
we became a dual agency, sexual assault agency, about a year and a half ago. So we provide the same services for sexual assault victims. We also have a crisis line where folks can receive support out in the community if they have been a victim of sexual assault and need support uh, or perhaps accompaniment to a forensic nurse exam or a hospital, something like that. And then part of the reason why I'm here is we are the recipients of a federal Department of Justice grant and have recently started a human trafficking project. So that's what we're going to talk about today is our work with victims of human trafficking, predominantly sex trafficking. So we received a grant to build a, a human trafficking program and recently received a transitional housing grant. So housing is a huge need for victims of sex trafficking and we are now the recipients of funding that will help us provide transitional housing, which would be housing from about six to 24 months for participants. So let's just go kind of right into uh, what sex trafficking is, but let's first kind of look at kind of a macro level of human trafficking. So human trafficking is a crime that involves the exploitation of a person for the purposes of compelled sex or labor. So human trafficking can be labor trafficking or it can be sex trafficking. So today we're gonna to talk about sex trafficking, which is specifically related to obtaining the person for the purpose of commercial sex acts, in which the sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion. So when we talk about human trafficking, we can think of foreign nationals that are brought over to the United States for purposes of exploiting them for labor, could be um, also foreign nationals who are brought over for purposes of exploiting for um, sex trafficking. However, today what we're gonna talk about is predominantly domestic sex trafficking. So people that uh, are from our own community that are being compelled into forced sex trafficking. So the important distinction that the law makes, there's a federal law and it's called the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. And in order to be a victim under that federal law, um, if you are over the age of 18, you must be induced in commercial, into commercial sex acts through force, fraud, or coercion. And we're gonna talk about that in just a minute. The law also provides that any child, any minor under the age of 18 induced into commercial sex acts is automatically listed as a victim. So essentially what the law decided, which is a good thing, is that any minor cannot be willingly engaging in um, sex trafficking or basically what people call child prostitution. So anyone who is a minor that is induced into commercial sex acts is automatically a victim. Anyone over the age of 18 um, must be induced through force, fraud, or coercion. So Stephen, I did not ask you, I'm just going to assume that you will interrupt if there's any questions from the audience members. So I'm just going to keep going if that's okay. Yeah, I can do that. Um, or I can hold them till the end and then we can review all of them then as well. Okay. It's, if anybody has anything timely, they're welcome to um, interrupt. That's just fine. Okay. Thank you. So when we're talking about force, fraud, or coercion, this is generally what you're going to see when um, we're talking about sex trafficking. So someone can be induced into sex trafficking through force. So someone who is kidnapped, um, who has been drugged or physically assaulted. Oftentimes what we see for domestic sex trafficking is that victims, especially those under the, 18, the age of 18, are induced into sex trafficking through fraud. Um, so we will talk about kind of, I'm not going to cover a lot about the lingo and the verbiage, but we've all heard the word pimp before. Um, sex traffickers are known as pimps and oftentimes what they'll do is trick victims into believing that they care for their victims. So that they are their boyfriend, they're going to take care of them. We're going to talk about what some of the vulnerabilities for people that may be at risk for sex trafficking are. Um, but one of them could also be a um, sex trafficker telling the victim that they're going to be a model, that they want them to model, they're beautiful, um, and then pretty soon they owe money for the photo shoot that they engaged in, or they owe money for the dinner that they were purchased. So there could be some kind of fraud. Um, offering to provide basic needs, 
one of the vulnerabilities for people that we see that are induced into sex trafficking are often um, homeless or have aged out of the system, and we'll talk about that. The other thing um, is that victims can be induced into sex trafficking through coercion. So someone could be blackmailed. Um, this slide talks about debt bondage. That's oftentimes more related to labor trafficking. Someone was brought into the United States and now owes a debt. Um, it could also be threats against friends and family that people are coerced into staying into the life of sex trafficking due to threats against their friends or family. So it sounds like as a town, Paradise Valley has talked about before domestic violence. And as Chief stated, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And I wanna point out one thing when we're talking about sex trafficking, and that is that there are some similarities between sex trafficking and the dynamics of domestic violence. And that main similarity is the power and control that's used in the dynamic between a sex trafficker and their victim often is the same as the power dynamic that um, is evident in domestic violence relationships. So as a result, the feelings that victims may be experiencing can be the same. So if you are working with someone who's a victim of sex trafficking, if you've ever supported a family or friend who is a victim of domestic violence, there's some common feelings that are associated with that. And oftentimes there can be shame, there can be self-blame, there can be secrecy. And if you add on top of that, the stigma that's involved when we talk about sex trafficking, people who have been forced to sell their bodies, their most intimate possession, um, there's more of a stigma attached to that. So oftentimes working with victims of sex trafficking, it's a challenging population um, because there's a stigma, there's secrecy, and because prostitution is not legal, there's also a fear of law enforcement. And so as uh, the town of Paradise Valley, I'm sure the police officers are, are attuned to that, that often sex trafficking victims do not want to engage with law enforcement. They don't want to get in trouble on top of everything else. And so I just wanted to point out kind of the similarities with that power and control dynamic, as well as just that extra layer of stigma that's attached for victims of sex trafficking. Okay, so just like domestic violence, sex trafficking can actually happen to anybody. There's not a single profile of a sex trafficking victim. It can be anyone regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, or socioeconomic status. So having said that, there are certain risk factors for sex trafficking, and especially for those um, that are under the age of 18, um, there's been a lot of studies out there that show that the risk factors for sex trafficking are usually for vulnerable populations. So these five are kind of the, the highest level of risk factors. So minors who are victims of childhood abuse, who have parents who are using substances in the home, who are victims of domestic violence, neglect, abandonment, who have a history of running away from home, and who are homeless or possibly economically impoverished. So the thing that all of this has in common is that traffickers often will prey on victims who have little or no social safety net. So what we see a lot is that sex traffickers can be inducing victims into the trade by saying, I'll provide basic needs. But more than that, they can also be saying, I'm gonna provide you love and stability. And uh, we can probably make an assumption there that it's not really the love that um, is a positive uh, enforcement in their life, but it is something that victims can be drawn into is if they have no support at home, oftentimes they may be more vulnerable to sex traffickers. So just to highlight a couple more of those vulnerabilities is that it could be family instability, poverty, gang involvement. They could have a history of abuse or themselves have a substance use issue, trauma, child welfare involvement, history of running away or sexual orientation. There are studies out there that note that uh, youth who are um, LGBTQ do have a higher risk of being um, preyed upon for sex trafficking. So again, what all of these vulnerabilities have in common is that victims have little or no social safety net. And those are generally who traffickers will prey on. Um, the other 
the other thing to note about this is that these vulnerabilities can also be indicative of people who are just struggling, who have been forced to um, have, you know, growing up in a different environment than, than some of us grew up in. Doesn't necessarily mean that they are a victim of sex trafficking, but these are oftentimes the vulnerabilities that sex traffickers will prey on. Um, okay, so what does this mean for Arizona? So what we see for sex trafficking scenarios in Arizona are very similar to really um, sex trafficking across the United States. So victims can be recruited, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later, into sex trafficking through escort services. Um, we've probably all heard about stings on massage parlors. Um, but generally what we're going to see is sex trafficking related to online internet ads. Um, there really aren't as many indoor residential brothels around Arizona. Um, street prostitution still does exist and strip clubs sometimes can be an avenue into sex trafficking. Um, the thing about Arizona that's interesting is that what they say, um, they meaning researchers or studiers, um, study, people who study sex trafficking, um, is that the same, the same economic forces that support tourism also support sex trafficking. So um, Arizona, we're known for tourism, right? Especially the town of Paradise Valley. Um, we have beautiful weather, we have beautiful resorts, we have a lot of things that draw tourism to, to our communities. And unfortunately, part of that nomadic population is also draws in some sex trafficking. And so there are people that kind of work a circuit. They go from Vegas to San Diego to possibly Phoenix and surrounding areas. So Arizona, and I don't have the numbers, um, and I can get those to Stephen later, but Arizona does have oftentimes what researchers say is a higher rate of sex trafficking. Um, as related to the economic forces, again, that support tourism. So in Arizona, ASU, and we're going to talk about some resources that ASU has in a little bit, but um, they have done a, a large study related to sex trafficking for minors in Arizona. What they found um, is that the average age of entry into sex trafficking as a minor in Arizona is approximately 14 years old. Um, the other thing that the study found, the 2018 results, is that almost 35% of homeless youth surveyed in Arizona reported that they had been exploited through sex trafficking. So when we're talking about minors, we're talking about really young people who are 14 but could possibly look or appear through pictures and online ads as older. Um, when we were talking about vulnerabilities before, the thing that's important to note is that oftentimes when we see children who have aged out of the child welfare system or foster care system, they lose any support. Once you turn 18, you're an adult. And so any support that they had through foster care, through counseling services, through community-based agencies, those supports often end once someone becomes an adult and they have to access a whole new level of services. And so that is a really high vulnerability, people that are in, uh, minors that are in foster care. And so that's why we see a pretty high number of homeless youth um, that have experienced sex trafficking. So Stephen and I were talking about what we kind of wanted to cover. And so I want to talk about some warning signs. And, and when I was thinking about this presentation, I wanted it to be from a place of, from those um, in the audience that are parents, but also just concerned citizens, community members. Um, but I want to just place a little bit of a caveat on the warning signs is that they, you know, research has shown that some of these warning signs are warning signs for sex trafficking. Obviously, that's what we're talking about today. However, I want to just, just note a caveat that these can also be warning signs of just an unstable um, home life or of a teen who's struggling for various reasons. So just because you see some of these warning signs, it doesn't automatically mean that someone is a victim of sex trafficking. I think we, we all know that, um, but I do just have to for my own um, well-being, just need to just to need to note that caveat. So, some warning signs for, and this is again predominantly focused on youth, is if someone um, is a chronic runaway, someone had really good attendance at school and they are now missing more school. Signs of physical abuse, 
Um, oftentimes we see minors who are talking about an older boyfriend or the presence of an older, um, oftentimes male in their life. So the majority of sex traffickers are males. They do use females to help recruit younger victims. However, usually pimps or other words that people use for sex traffickers, they are, they are male. Um, and so when you hear um, minors talking about an older boyfriend, um, oftentimes that can be a sign. Involvement in the system, that could be the child welfare system, that could be the juvenile system or any criminal justice system. Owning expensive items, so someone who is um, from a lower socioeconomic status who normally wouldn't have the means to have a uh, fancy high-end you know, luxury handbag or sunglasses or things like that, oftentimes those expensive items are status symbols within sex trafficking and can be purchased um, by pimps for, for victims. Um, change in behavior is a big one really for anyone who is susceptible for any kind of abuse or exploitation. If someone has isolated themselves, if they appear more distant, nervous, if someone has good support from friends or family and they are now um, having less communication with positive influences in their life. Um, tattoos are branding and if we had more time we could go into this but oftentimes um, pimps will utilize tattoos or branding um, because they view victims of sex trafficking as their property so there could be um, pimps name tattooed on a very prominent location um, some pimps use barcodes they view victims as property so much like we would scan an item at a self-checkout for a grocery store there's a barcode on there and oftentimes pimps will utilize barcodes, tattoos to where they are um, again identifying that person, that human being as their property. There's also vocabulary. Um, you can, can look on, on ASU and other resources that we'll talk about. There's a whole vocabulary associated with the life and the life is what the word for sex trafficking often is. So there's different names for different kinds of pimps. There's different names for people that are living in the same, what they call stable, which is kind of the family unit, using the term family loosely, but the unit of um, women that are living together. And again, minors who are owned by the pimp and exploited. So there's a whole vocabulary that, that I didn't want to get into today, but there are resources out there um, for you to, to learn about that vocabulary if you feel like you need to. Okay, so let's talk about, and again, this is just a really quick overview and we're gonna have time for questions, but um, wanted to talk about what you can do. So, so my assumption is, is that for those of you that are attending, you have a vested interest in, in your community and in, in helping people and learning more. And so part of that is figuring out what we can do. So what we can do is kind of think about those vulnerabilities and, and spot some red flags, but probably what's more important is that um, really knowing the people that are in our lives. So um, our own children, the children who look up to us um, in, our, in our community and really opening the lines of communication to where you can see those changes in behavior. So again, you don't necessarily have to be an expert on sex trafficking or every topic, but usually if there is someone who you care about in your life, you're going to notice a change in behavior, right? So the context of someone changing their behavior is usually those red flags that, we're gonna, that we have talked about. Um, the other important thing is to really open lines of communication, not just about trafficking, but about healthy relationships. Um, it sounds like you guys have had someone from Katie's Way talking about teen dating violence. I think Steven said that was last year. Um, but again, healthy relationships and understanding that power and control dynamic and a healthy relationship, that dynamic really shouldn't be present. Um, the big thing for trafficking um, in this day and age is internet and social media use. And so this is a big one. Um, Teens have a tendency to overshare on social media. Well, adults too, but I'm just going to talk about teens. But they have a tendency to overshare sometimes, um, both with tagging locations and with pictures and things like that. Um, the internet and social media is probably the number one avenue used for recruiting 
minors into sex trafficking. And I touched on this before, but oftentimes it could be someone saying, you're beautiful. Um, I, you know, I sign people to model. Will you come and take some pictures? Um, I'd love to see um, some professional photos of you taken, things like that. So that can often be a way that a trafficker can enter into a victim's life. And so really talking with the, the youth in, in your life about just kind of just some internet and social media safety use. So don't add, you know, some people really want to have a bunch of followers on Instagram. You can tell that I'm getting older because I don't even know the lingo <laughs> of, all of, of all of the social media, but, but your teens do. And so, so ask them questions, but, you know, not adding people and accepting friend requests from strangers, setting your account settings to private, things like that. Um, also asking questions is a really good way to open those lines of communication. So asking, you know, the questions that start with what if, or what would you do? So just like talking to teens, hopefully in our lives about healthy relationships, there can also be some scenario questions. What would you do if someone asked you to send a picture of yourself that was inappropriate? What would you do if someone approached you about modeling? What would you do if an older um, single male approached you um, before when, when our lives were different? Malls could be a, a big recruiting area for people um, into sex trafficking. They would approach teens and say, you know, you're beautiful. Do you want to model? So using something like that as a scenario, what would you do if that happened? Um, I don't think all of us are hanging out in malls these days. And so maybe that's that's a positive related to sex trafficking, but the internet still does exist. So really opening those lines of communications with people um, in your life. The other thing is knowing your resources. So we're gonna talk about resources in just a second. Uh, actually, we're gonna talk about them now. So there are some really good local resources. Again, Arizona, um, because I think we are a little bit more of a hotspot for sex trafficking, there's been some really good resources available in the community. Um, the website sextraffickinghelp.com is a really good one. Um, and then here are just some phone numbers. And I believe that this is going to be available to you um, through Stephen if you did want to get copies of this. Um, the Phoenix Non-Emergency Vice Hotline, if you do believe that someone is engaged in prostitution or sex trafficking. Um, the Arizona Child Abuse Hotline, 888-SOS-CHILD, is always a good number to have. And the National Human Trafficking Hotline is a great resource. They have, you can call and you can also text. Um, they, it can be if, if a victim is calling, that's how they will help them be hooked up in, with resources in Arizona. And it could also just be, you know, somebody saying I have a concern about a neighbor or about my daughter um, and you can ask questions and get resources. Um, Arizona School of Social Work has these amazing brochures and what they've done is these are just examples of them. They've broken them down by kind of topic. So uh, what do you need to know as a parent? There's some that are what do you need to know as healthcare workers, as law enforcement, as school counselors. So they have some really good information and especially the ones for parents have some really good talking points that you can utilize to talk to the kids in your life about sex trafficking. Again, this, this website would be um, a good one uh, for you to look at. So it's, you can actually just Google ASU and the STIR project, S-T-I-R. Um, it's a sex trafficking, I don't remember the I, I think it's, Institute for Research or something, but um, they have really good resources and we'll have this website available to you as well. So the last thing, just really quickly, if you do um, somehow engage in conversation with someone that you believe is at risk for sex trafficking or is possibly being trafficked, kind of just some important things to do that you can say and, and ways to offer support. And this is really just for anybody, um, someone who maybe you have a concern about a relationship that they're in or something is, is really what we can do is we can listen. Listening is free. Um, we can express compassion. We can be patient. And we can also respect privacy. So again, there is a lot of stigma associated with trafficking and kind of our just societal uh, interpretation of, of what prostitution is and, and what it looks like to us. And so 
a lot of victims, again, that stigma and that shame really lives on the surface. And so not blaming people, not being judgmental. Um, and hopefully, you know, if, if we're all coming from a place of wanting to help, so I, my assumption is that none of those things would be present, but really um, just listening and expressing compassion for folks. Some really good things that you can say, instead of just automatically throwing resources at people, if they're not ready to hear them, if you think maybe somebody's at risk, but you're not sure, you can always just say things like, I'm concerned for you. I'm concerned for your safety. Um, I'm here if you need me. You're not alone and there's help available. So those are always just some good, some good um, supportive statements that people can say. So people in their lives know that you're a safe person to talk to and hopefully they would reach out to you should they find themselves in any trouble. So that is the very quick highlight for uh, what sex trafficking is and, and just some warning signs. So I want to open it up to questions um, of things that I didn't cover or questions that you may have. So if anybody has questions, you can use the feature where you can raise your hand and then I can unmute you or if you want to send them in, we can do that as well. And Angela, I thought that was a really good presentation. I've seen some of the material before, but the way you presented it, it was um, very well done. And I just, I was really good. Great, thank you. It's always tough to, to talk about these topics first thing in the morning. So I appreciate everybody being open to it. We at least gave you a warning of what you were getting yourself into before your first cup of coffee, so. All right, excellent presentation. Will you email it? Um, we will be putting it onto our website, onto YouTube, so you'll be able to uh, review it. Also, um, if for the resources, I'll go through there and I can copy those links. And for everybody who's attended today, I can forward that over to everybody as well. So all the links that were mentioned as resources at the end, I'll send that to everybody who's enrolled. And then we've got a question of how often do we see this in PV? Um, I'm not certain of any um, reports that we have. Would um, Chief or Commander be able to comment on that question? You know, um, I'm not aware of any in Paradise Valley either. Typically we see an uptick during, you know, when big events come. So Super Bowl, uh, Final Four, that kind of thing. Um, so obviously we'll be staging up for that training, retraining the officers on it um, as the Super Bowl comes back to Phoenix in the near future. Mm -hmm. Another question here is, are there any particular hot spots for targeting teens, um, certain malls, et cetera? And I think Angela kind of pointed towards social media as being one of the areas. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I would say now social media more so um, and just kind of internet internet usage. What we're seeing is um, a lot on Instagram. People um, have a tendency to post a, some more because it's a photo based social media. Um, oftentimes when they have their their settings open public instead of private, um, people will just kind of kind of look at different people's open accounts. So Social media is one. Um, malls used to be a big one. I know that um, there was kind of a, a sting that they were doing years and years ago, Arrowhead, Arrowhead Mall. Um, but I do think that just like our technology evolves, people who prey on people, their, their resources and their knowledge evolve too. And so really, especially with how much time we're all spending online, like right now on Zoom and, and kids going to school online and, and seeing their friends online, I, I would really say social media and internet is probably the number one kind of hot spot for recruitment or um, at risk areas. Mm -hmm. All right, I don't see any other questions coming in at this time. If you do have other questions, um, I'll do a follow-up email with some resources and you'll have my contact information also Angela's and you can always reach out to us. I want to thank everybody for coming today and uh, have a wonderful week.
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today, Angela. You're welcome to.